The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who have dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they picked themselves up, and how they hope workplaces can change in the future. Today's guest founded a company that makes a product many of you probably use. It's a website that makes dreams come true. If your dream is figuring out your dream vacation plans, that is. And he believes that one of his CEO's superpowers is his ability to observe the human dynamics, what's going on between people in a room that's not spoken. And, he says, one of the biggest leadership skills is listening to people. Hear that, mansplainers? And observing how they feel in the moment. Something that he learned growing up in a very small house with nine people. In 2004, Paul English co-founded Kayak, an online travel agency and meta search engine. He helped scale that company. There was a $2 billion exit, and he was incredibly productive and driven. But there was something else going on. Paul has bipolar disorder. And that has had all kinds of impacts, positive and negative, on his working life. In his highs, Nothing could stop him. He said that if you could bottle how he feels when he's in a manic phase, it would sell for a billion dollars. But when Paul was heading into a depression, he learned to understand the signs that one was coming. Trouble focusing, irritation. And he knew that he had to learn to confide in key colleagues. He'd need help making it through. Today, Paul keeps going at a breakneck pace, constantly coming up with new business ideas, and he works across the for-profit and non-profit spheres, but he also works hard to stay mentally and emotionally healthy. Here's my conversation with Paul English. So I was um, doing some research on you, and one of the things that you said, which I just thought was fantastic, and I, I wanted to know the history of it, is you said that uh, you said if you weren't the multi hyphenate business person, entrepreneur, coder that you are, you would probably like to be a therapist. And I was curious, is that true, and and why? It is true, and I'm someone who. Like I took a Myers Briggs test years ago, and I peg right in the middle between introvert and extrovert. I'm probably a little bit more introvert. However, I would say I'm a student of human dynamics. I grew up in a three bedroom house with nine people. Two of my siblings became therapists. My mother was a social worker. And growing up in a tiny house with nine people means you grow up focused on dynamics, like who's mad today, what's what's going on in the house today. And I think that trained me to really focus on interactions. And I would say 5% of the time I spend each of my companies is watching interactions. And for example, if you're very observant, one of the things you'll notice is in meetings is men interrupt women more than women interrupt men, which is obviously terrible. But there's a number of things that if you pay a lot of attention, you can tweak the interactions with your team to be more productive and less stressful. Hmm, Like what? How do you stop mansplaining, Paul? Please do the world a favor. (laughs) I think the way to stop mansplaining is you listen. And (laughs) if if we each have a little bit of humility, I mean, hopefully as leaders, we have some confidence in some of the things we do, right? And hopefully we're competent, like I'm good at software design and hopefully I'm confident in that. But I think the smartest people also have humility because you realize that everyone knows something that you don't know. And so if you take that to your management team or your team, even if people think differently and speak differently and work differently, I think everyone has something you can learn from. So I think the first thing is just become a good listener. You know, it's funny because we don't often think of entrepreneurs as being good listeners because there is such that sense of an entrepreneur always in motion, always driving forward, which it, almost when you visualize it doesn't seem to coincide with good listening. 
I don't know. I think the biggest skill for a CEO, particularly for a high pressure startup where you're really going for it, is removing stress and trying to develop a team which has the uh, the mojo. Mm -hmm. And if you want a team which is exciting to work on and to work together, you have to become observant of interactions. So when did you first notice that you were noticing people at work the way that you might have as a kid growing up in your family? I think the very first time I was a manager, I tried it. It was a difficult transition for me from going to programmer to manager. And I tried to figure out people on my team and what they needed. And I was probably a terrible manager for the first year or two. But I read a lot of books. I studied people who I thought were good leaders. And I learned. And one thing, for example, I learned is Maya Angelou, I think she's the source of this quote that um, people don't remember what you said to them, but they remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And that's something that I probably wasn't that good as a first time manager that like as a programmer, I was prolific and fast. And as a manager, initially when I started being, you know, trying to be prolific and fast, you didn't listen enough to people. And I think I learned over my first few years that if you pay attention to people and see what's on their mind, you can make them happier, more productive. Yeah, exactly. So, so you're a believer in both literally listening to what people say, but it sounds like also tuning in to the unspoken in a room. Yeah, 100%. So you have bipolar disorder. I do. Do you believe that your journey with this condition has made you more perceptive to other people? Like, what's the role that the bipolar plays in your observation? I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages of bipolar. Um, if you're someone who works in the creative industry, one of the nice things about po bipolar is you have endless energy and you can pursue new ideas and listen to new ideas and adopt new ideas and always focus on the shiny new object and trying to innovate and think of something new. Um, there are many bad parts of bipolar. And for me, it was mostly really bad in my 20s and 30s where I had really bad depression and was homebound for um, you know, several days, if not weeks at a time. But I think if you're tuned to paying attention to people around you and understanding not just what's going on in your own head, but what's going on in their head, it allows you to be productive with a team if you care about other people on that team. And so I think that has helped me a lot. I think um, studies of mindfulness have actually helped me a lot. Mm. It's helped me be calm. There's a Buddhist saying, which is respond, don't react. Mm -hmm. And I have this theory about meditation, for example, I've meditated for many years, and most people try meditation, they try to, let's say, focus on their breath. Mm -hmm. And let's say they set their timer for 10 minutes, and maybe nine minutes in, all of a sudden they realize, whoa, I've been thinking about work for the last nine minutes. I'm terrible at this. This is really hard. I don't want to do this again. And I think the secret to meditation is each time you notice distraction, which is a very normal thing, and you, you notice, you become aware that you're distracted is step one. And that's step two, when you bring it back to your breath, if you do that over and over and over again, you develop muscle memory for how to go from distraction to calm. Mm. And if you do that, let's say each time you do that, it's like doing a push up. And if you do that thousands and thousands of times, nothing will rattle you going forward. And you can be a calm voice in a, on a team. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Take us back to when you were in your 20s and you were a young man bed bed bound. What would you tell work? How did you how did you get by? I think the biggest thing, a lot of us early in our careers suffer from imposter syndrome where we get promoted and promoted and promoted and suddenly we're in a position where like me as a young VP of engineering 
there are many days I thought, am I really competent to be running this big team, you know, with 100 programmers on it? And one of the tricks I learned early on, and I don't think a teacher or mentor taught me this, I think I just kind of discovered on my own, is if you're vulnerable, and initially just to a small set of people, Mm -hmm. you're really honest to them. The trick with vulnerability is vulnerability means you have nothing to hide anymore because you're open. And hopefully you don't walk around, you know, complaining all day because you don't want people feeling sorry for you. But if you're open about what I'm confident about and what I'm worried about, people will lean in. I've often said that people will follow confidence, but they'll be loyal to vulnerability. Hmm. So that helped me a lot early in my career. Would you say to them, I'm really depressed? What would you say? Yeah. So initially earlier in my career, I would say it to a very small set of people. Mm -hmm. And I would confide in them that I'm having trouble focusing. I'm getting really irritated all the time, which is a symptom of depression. And they would help guide me and just accept me for being open with them. And then over the years, one, I learned how to help myself through therapy and study of Buddhism and all that. But also I learned to be more comfortable to be open with people. And I have just found that if you're open with people, like they'll lean in and they will help you. We had recently in my company, Lola, um, I run a company called Lola.com mm-hmm. and we do business travel and expense management. And I sent an email out to the team a couple of weeks ago because May is mental health awareness month. And I just kind of confided in the whole team to say, I have bipolar illness. I've struggled a lot, particularly in my twenties and thirties. And one of the things I like about this team is we're open with each other. And I just want to let people know if you're struggling or some of your family is struggling, you should always feel free to call me in confidence. I'm happy to talk about it or to use our employee assistance program, which we have great benefits that have helped people as well. And I think that just being open like that, I got a, a lot of email and response from people on the team just appreciating me being openness. And I think me being open about my own struggles kind of gives people permission to be open about theirs. If you have an episode now where you're depressed, do you feel comfortable sharing it with a wider group of people than maybe you did when you were in your 20s? I do. Like, for example, the last couple of decades, really, I've run VC-backed businesses with venture capitalists on my board. Right. And very quietly, I would find like one VC on the board that I felt comfortable with and felt a friendship with, and I'd be open to that person. And then over time, I just became open about if I'm struggling with personal stuff, like hopefully people at work and I'm like, well, we'll know I'm working really hard and I'm committed to the cause. But if they also know that occasionally I'll go through phases where I'll struggle either with depression or hypomania, um, they'll see that in the picture of me overall mm. and they'll accept me for that. And again, the other key thing about being a entrepreneurial leader, if you have mental health issues, is be really selective about who you hire as your first five employees and the first 10 employees. And you want people that have skills you don't, and they can help each other through tough times. And you want to hire people that are themselves good recruiters and charismatic. And if you surround yourself with people that have skills different than you, for example, I'm more kind of shiny object syndrome, excited about the new idea (laughs) than I am focused on process. But with each of my companies, I always make sure to hire people in the very early days who are really good at process and they can make up for my weaknesses. I love that. I want to pull out two things that you said for the audience that I think we don't hear a lot. One is that you told a VC that you had, did you say I have bipolar? I did. Because that feels, I mean, these people are basically gambling on you. They're giving you money and, and risking a lot. That feels brave to me. It was risky. I've also been open And it's more as I've gotten older and have had success despite my mental health issues, I've been successful. I've created four successful companies in a row. And so people have confidence that they know that even if I do have my struggles, somehow I can figure out how to hire a great team and how to make that team successful. Well, now they do, but I bet they didn't before you had a billion dollar exit. It's probably I've become more comfortable over the years. Like the more success I've seen, Mm -hmm. I become more comfortable about being open about my own struggles. 
So let's talk about the good days because this is fascinating. You said that um, <laughs> if someone could invent a drug that would let people feel the way that you do on your best days of hypomania, they'd make a billion dollars. <laughs> Why? A hundred percent. So I don't do drugs myself. Like I smoke weed every now and then to relax. But when I talk to friends who take drugs, I feel like I don't need to take the drugs because the highs are part of my normal cycle. Mm. And I feel like when I'm in a car and I'm, let's say, stopped at a red light, I can sense color, like on a building, like I'm very um, aware of what color looks like at 10 a.m. versus 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. And when I'm manic or hypomanic, colors have a huge impact on me. And little things like, again, you're at a stoplight and you notice there's a breeze that's moving the grass next to the street. That stuff is really intense for me. I have really intense feelings about visuals. Is is that called synesthesia? Like when you when you see yeah, colors around there's people? Some and, there's some of that. How yes. does that infl- like what does that do when you're an entrepreneur? I would imagine you feel like you could probably start ten companies in a day. Yeah, which I don't know that I've done ten in a day, but I've certainly done more than one. In a day um, for real? Yeah, for real. <laughs> I um like I'm I'm coming up with ideas every week for new companies and new products. And some of the times I'll pursue them as a side project. So for example, at Kayak, I had two initiatives I started on the side that both are very successful right now. Mm-hmm. I started a website called gethuman.com, which is about serving customer service info. If you want to get Verizon on the phone without press one, press two, but you want to get direct to human, we teach you how to do that. That was created out of frustration with me of getting people on the phone. And when I'm frustrated with something, I can't leave it alone. I have to do something with it. And then I also built um, the leading online platform for developing country health workers to coordinate with each other about like infectious disease, for example. It's called GHD Online, Global Health Delivery Online. And it has tens of thousands of health workers around the world in developing countries who compare notes about HIV treatment, tuberculosis treatment, malaria treatment. And that was created as a side project for me while I was a kayak because I was helping a nonprofit and realizing that as I went from nonprofit to nonprofit, like country to country, and I realized that they weren't sharing best practices and they it's lonely to be a medical worker in, in a developing country and just using the internet to connect them made them a lot more comfortable that they had someone they could talk to. So I created that with some friends, and it's now an official project at Harvard University, Harvard Medical School. Do people ever get frustrated with you when you're in one of those manic but also highly productive phases? I think people have to, who work with me have to have a sense of humor about it, just know that I'm always going to be chasing new ideas. I mean, most of my creation hopefully is around the day job. So for Lola right now, that's my passion. And hopefully I can help work with the team, come up with new ideas all the time about how to make sure business travel and expense works a lot better than it did before Lola existed. And there's a lot of room for innovation when you're in a startup. But when I jump on another idea, I just have to see it through its completion. So when you were... um at the height of your kayak fame, because I think kayak's probably the most well-known, right, of your, yeah. Like, were you on the speaking circuit? Did you do that whole superstar CEO kind of deal? Yeah, I was on a speaking circuit. I did a lot of press. And I had to teach myself tricks of how to get around my introversion Mm -hmm. when you have to give a presentation to thousands of people. And so I learned some tricks. And so, for example, one thing is the first time I spoke in front of thousands of people, your voice, my voice would crack and my voice would just sound like I'm very nervous. And that, then I was insecure about that. Mm. And so I learned this trick that once I gave a a keynote presentation or conference with thousands of people and I was literally backstage, you know, literally before the curtains open and I found a cameraman backstage who was taking photos of the event. And what I did is I just talked to him and I do not have a problem connecting with people one-on-one. So I talked to this cameraman, asked him about his weekend, about, his travels, his family. And I talked with him and we were high energy back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then bam, and the light went on and I had to speak. But because I had been literally speaking for the last five minutes, one-on-one, I didn't have any of that tremor in my voice. And I was able to appear 
that I was confident. Huh. That's a great, what are some other, do you have any others? I think it's, um, I used to be a pretty active musician and I played a bunch of instruments. And when you play, I remember studying trumpet, which is one of my instruments. And the instructor told me when you're playing trumpet on a stage in front of a, let's say thousands of people, you have to project like you're singing to the person in the back of the audience, you have a conversation with them. And focusing on, as a musician, you're communicating to someone specific in the audience, it's an easy thing to, to do. And so when I'm presenting to a large group of people, I pretend I'm presenting to one person in the audience. And I'll look at someone in the audience and talk to them. And then maybe just so I'm not like focused on one person, I'll focus on someone else and someone else. But it's almost like you're having a small conversation. Like when I've done press, I've been on... And I think I think it was the Today Show and a bunch of national TV. And I've gotten really good feedback from my colleagues that they think I've done well mm -hmm. when I've been on national media. But my trick is I just focus on the person interviewing me like I'm having a private conversation and I ignore the cameras. Yeah. You have to stay in the moment. Otherwise, it can get overwhelming, right? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about criticism, right? Because I think that... Um, Anyone out there who's who's known a depression will know that um, when you're depressed, you you can feel very fragile, right? And you can you can feel like a failure, even though there's no evidence that you are. And I'm curious if there have been times in your in your cycles, both as a leader and as a someone with bipolar, where um, criticism has meshed with a time that you've been feeling fragile, and how you've managed through that. Yeah, it is difficult. Um, I think the way to deal with it is, again, is to have your secret like cheerleaders or colleagues you're really close to mm -hmm. and talk with them and be open with them and be vulnerable to them. And they can help keep you centered on the things you're good at and things you've done well that you need to keep focusing on and keep doing well. And that has helped me a lot, having some confidence. How do you know who's going to be a good confidant? I mean, you take a risk. Hmm. A lot of life of entrepreneurship is just a series of risks. And to be a good entrepreneur, you have to be a risk taker. And some of risk taking is risk taking relationships. Be open with someone and see how they respond to it. Some people don't respond well when you're super open about your struggles. And they might get weirded out. Like they don't know how to support you. Uh, but you get that sense. And you don't want to force everyone to be like a shrink for you. You don't want people to think that, you know, you're going to get on the couch and dump all your problems every time they see you. But I think through experimenting and opening up a little bit, you'll find people that are good connectors that you can be comfortable talking with. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be everyone in the company. You can run a company of 1,000 people or 10,000 people. And maybe it's just three people that are your confidants you're really open with. And people, they can give you feedback in a way that you know there's a, enough of a connection that you're not insecure about giving each other direct feedback. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about um, real nitty gritty, you know, time management. Because <laughs> obviously you're an incredibly productive person. Uh, but I would also imagine that like such a banal thing as – scheduling and, you know, the life of an executive might, how do you maintain that both when you're in a manic state and there's just too much to do in a day and when you're in a depressed state and it may be hard to get out of bed? Like, what are the guardrails that you've learned to put into place that keep you on task, on schedule and sort of as balanced as you can be? Yeah, I'll tell you something. <laughs> that people find surprising about me. I'm on seven nonprofit boards, three of them are nonprofits that I started and that I run. <clears throat> I'm running Lola. And then I have two passion projects on the side. I have a podcast player called Moonbeam. That's a new podcast player, which I can describe in a minute. And then there's a Chinese game that I learned in grad school that I have an obsession with that I work a little bit on the weekends. I also teach, I guess lecture at different universities and business schools on entrepreneurship. And with all that stuff, seven nonprofits plus all those companies plus teaching, I actually lead a life with very little stress. And the reason I'm able to do that is I'm very disciplined about my time management. 
So I have an amazing assistant, Eliza, who you may have spoken to in setting this interview mm -hmm. up today. Mm -hmm. And Eliza and I look at my calendar every Monday, Friday, two weeks in advance, and we color code. And there's four colors. And the colors basically mean Lola, which are my most important meetings, because that's the company I'm running during the day. Um, Self-improvement, anything from, like I take meditation class on Thursday nights, if I go to the gym to work out with a trainer, if I go to a medical appointment, I consider all that self-improvement. Nonprofit work, which I do about eight hours a week, sometimes much more than that. And then the final category is friends and family. And when I look at my Google calendar, Monday, Friday, for two weeks in the head, I make sure there's a balance between those colors. And when there's not a balance, life feels bad to me. And when there's a balance, life feels very good to me. And the other thing about- It's the color again, though. Obviously, color is a big thing for you. <laughs> yeah, it is. I have a visceral response to colors. But um, the other thing about time management is you have to be really good about saying no. Mm. And you have to develop kind of like a blow off template when someone, like I get hit up to invest in companies a lot. I've done a lot of angel investing. Mm -hmm. And occasionally someone will, I mean, often someone will hit me up for a company that I just wouldn't add value to because it's in a space that I have no domain expertise and not a strong interest. So you have to be really good at turning things down because if you accept every invitation comes across you, you'll lead a stressful life. One exercise I've taught new managers in my team is to code their Google Calendar between what are meetings that they that they initiated, that they requested, and what are meetings that they're going to because someone invited them. And if you look at your calendar a week in advance or a week in the past, there should be a balance between meetings that you initiated versus meetings you were requested to join. Because if you're doing more of the latter and less of the former, you're going to have a very stressful week if all you're doing is responding to other people. So you need to figure out what's your happy place. So for me, my happy place is working with designers and I make sure that I have design reviews regularly throughout my week because that's where I feel most productive and most connected to the work. What makes you anxious or what has made you anxious throughout your, throughout your work life? I mean, social anxiety. I have social anxiety. So I frequently, like a meeting will happen and I'll say something. And I'll think afterwards, oh, that was stupid what I said. I hope I didn't like offend anyone in the meeting <laughs> or... Um, I hope I didn't come down too hard on someone. And then um, I really dislike cocktail parties and I dislike networking events. So those give me a lot of anxiety. But not taking huge risks or? Not at all. <laughs> no, like I'm happy to invest, you know, millions of dollars in a new idea, but I commit myself to a project that has no funding yet. Um, it's but but you can't make small talk with someone you don't even know and we're never we'll never even see again at a party. Right. <laughs> it's such a crazy thing, isn't it? I guess so, yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, the brain. Um the last thing I, I wanted to ask you about is is really bringing it full circle back to childhood and roles and family dynamics. I'm a big fan of helping people think about how their upbringing has informed their leadership and how they act and react at work. Since you are too, I'm curious if this is something that you bring into the companies and organizations that you run, or if you have any advice that you think would be helpful for people who are sort of looking up, even now after the pandemic, right, when we've realized a lot of things about ourselves that we may not have realized before, are there any helpful reflections to think about, about your childhood, your family of origin, your birth order, whatever, that can help you learn new things as a leader? I mean, one thing I really enjoyed at work is learning about your colleagues' childhoods. Mm. And I find that if you, I have one of the executives on my team who have a very um, high output working relationship but we're very, very different. Um, this person is more process oriented and conservative and I'm more shiny new object, try something new. And literally when we've talked about our childhood, um, it's helped me connect and understand them a bit. They often say if there's someone you struggle with, like that you have to work with, but you really have a very difficult time with them, to picture them as a child or picture them as a very old person because it's easy, hopefully it's easy for all of us to have compassion to any child. And hopefully it's easy for us to have compassion for an old person. 
and we need to recognize at work is we all have our outside lives. We all have been shaped by different experiences. And if you could look at someone holistically, like the, the arc of their life, you can see that we all have different journeys and you can learn from people that are different than you. So that has allowed me to have compassion for other people. It's just to learn a little bit more about their story. And you don't need to do it all in one meeting. You know, I, I think people are more complicated than that. I don't think you can debug someone in a single meeting, but just have part of the conversation about spending time getting to know each other helps understand how they think at work. I mean, parenting, I have two kids and there's a lot of lessons in parenting that's similar to lessons in running a company. And when you connect to other people that work with the parents, you can talk about that, about some of the parallels between parenting and leading a company, for example. What's one of your favorite parallels? Oh, let me see. If you have young children, one of the things you learn, hopefully learn very quickly with two-year-olds is it's difficult to get two-year-olds to do something because they start developing a mind of their own. And so what you learn as a parent is don't ever say to your kids, do you want to go to grandma's house? Because it allows them to say no, because they want to have a mind of their own independence. So what you do is rather than giving your kid questions with yes, no answers, you give them questions with like an A or a B answer. Like you say, do you want to go to grandma's house or do you want to go to lunch? And you make them make a choice between two things. And it's similar to that way in work. Like when I work with engineers, so I'm an engineer by training and I love engineers and I like hanging out with engineers, but engineers can be difficult and sometimes if you want to get an engineer to work on something new, you don't say, would you be able to build this this week? Because that allows them to say no. Instead, you say things like, if we had to build this in a week, what's a way that you could do it? And you challenge them with a question that's how rather than can you. Because that gets their brain going and they like that. It's like a Absolutely. challenge. Absolutely. Um, so, Paul, tell me more about this podcast player that you're developing. Yeah, so I am someone that listens to podcasts every day. Uh, I probably read less now that I've become addicted to podcasts over the last few years. But I find that podcast players are unsatisfying to me. And I wanted to build another podcast player that solved two problems. The first problem is how do you discover a show? Like, more, how do people find your show? And can we come up with a different mechanism to let you browse content by listening rather than by reading. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole discovery mechanism that's a little bit different that allows you to rapidly flip through the curated clips of the best shows, best content. And some of them are big shows, some of them are small shows. And then the second thing we focus on is what's the relationship between the podcast host and her audience? And we wanted to provide tools right in the podcast player where you can interact with that show, interact with the host, and interact with other listeners. A lot of podcast hosts will go and set up like a Facebook group yeah. where people discuss their podcast. But what if you had that built right into the podcast player so people could interact with you and they could click a button and send a tip to your show or to a nonprofit you support. They can click a button and join your email list so you can give them newsletters once a week with that behind the scenes stories. They can comment on an episode, like what's their favorite point about an episode and talk to other work, other listeners. So Moonbeam is a product, it's moonbeam.fm, and we focus on two things, the discovery problem and then the interaction with the host. Well, Paul English, I want to thank you so much for your time. Yeah, this has been great. It's been great to connect with you more. That's it for today's show. Thank you to my producer, Mary Dew. Thanks to the team at HBR I'm grateful to our guests for sharing their experiences and truths. For you, our listeners, who ask me to cover certain items and keep the feedback coming, please do send me feedback. You can email me. You can uh, leave a message on LinkedIn for me or tweet me at Mora AM. And if you love the show, tell your friends. Subscribe and leave a review. From HBR Presents, this is Mora Aaron's Mealy.